for the second session, we're moving from evaluation of the heart to evaluation of the nerve. The nerve is such a critical component of this because it's not only just the feeling in your hands and feet and your strength, but it controls your respiratory rate, your heart rate, your bowel function, your blood pressure, and all of these can go awry in amyloidosis. And so we're fortunate to have a number of speakers, experts on the topic. Chafi Karam is a expert neurologist from the University of Pennsylvania who has extensive experience both in the diagnosis as well as in gene silencing treatment for TTR amyloid, and he'll be talking to us a little bit about available treatments for amyloid neuropathy. Professor Karam. Thank you, Professor Gertz, and thank you, Muriel, and thank you all for coming today. And thank you for everybody that I've um, interacted with. Um, it's always nice when you guys stop by and say hi. I appreciate it. So I'll be discussing peripheral neuropathy treatment, specifically HATTR, because that's really where the treatment have been approved and studied the most. Uh, and then Dr. Brannigan will be talking about the management of the symptoms, meaning the pain, the blood pressure issue, et cetera. So transthyretin, we've already learned a lot about it, and you probably learn, already know a lot about it. It's made mainly by the liver. It's also made a little bit in the brain, in, in an area called the choroid plexus, and in the eye. And the treatment are really targeting right now the liver, or once the protein is spilled in the blood, to stabilize it. So these are the two things we do, silencing and stabilizing. You've seen this before, the, um, the TTR is made in the liver, it's translated by the RNA, and then it circulates in a form of tetramer, but if it misfolds and, uh, or dissociates, then misfolds, it becomes toxic to the nerve, to the heart, to the eyes, to the brain, to the guts, and so forth. It sticks to organ and it causes toxicity. So I already mentioned that. We're going to mainly focus on the specific treatment of the transthyretin, and then Dr. Brannigan uh, later will talk about the symptoms. And in the past, before we have all these drugs available, the best way to treat this disease was to actually have a liver transplantation. So the liver, which is always healthy in people with uh, HATTR amyloidosis, by the way, but it's making this protein that has a variant and that is prone to misfold and cause the amyloidosis. So back in the 90s, people started doing liver transplant, and that was the main available treatment for many years. Until more recently, we've had major breakthrough in the treatment of amyloidosis, and these were the silencers, and then we also have the stabiliz stabilization treatment. So in the silencer, we silence the RNA, which translate the uh, DNA into the protein, which is the transthyretin. And we have uh, several of those now. We have the patisiran and the vitriceran, inotursin and implotursin. And then hopefully in the future, we'll have the gene editing therapy with CRISPR-Cas9. And then uh, after the protein is secreted and it's in the blood, you can stabilize it with uh, what we call stabilizers, uh, diflunizole, tafamidis, uh, acuramidis, and hopefully in the future, we'd be able to remove this protein by directing antibodies against it. So these are the PRX and uh, uh, the Alexion treatments as well. So what is approved by the FDA? So what is something that the FDA said, okay, this is good, you can use it in clinical practice, and the insurance should cover it without a lot of problem, hopefully. These are the three available options. You have patisiran or onpatro, inotursin or texeri, and vitriceran or uh, as known as amvutra. Now, we have drugs that are available in the US and they have been studied in peripheral neuropathy, but they're not officially approved by the FDA for the management of neuropathy. So one is diflunizole, we use it as an off-label, and tafamidis, probably a lot of you are uh, aware of it, is FDA approved for the cardiomyopathy, but not for the peripheral neuropathy. That doesn't mean it doesn't work on the neuropathy as well. So this is important when you're worried about your symptoms, et cetera, and we'll approach this in a little bit later. And then the latest to probably come on the market, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, is iplotersin. 
and it's currently awaiting FDA approval, but the data also looks very good. And then in the future, I think we'll have a lot of option, maybe, we don't know, we'll see. But you have other stabilizers, tolcapone, penetrate the nervous system and the eye. So this is something that hopefully will help with these things if clinical trial eventually uh, become available. Uh, AG10, which already has undergo phase three gene therapy and antibodies, um, and hopefully other as well. So before I go into the details of how these drug works and what were the results of the clinical trial, I want to talk about the outcomes of peripheral neuropathy. So how do we measure peripheral neuropathy? Uh, so you can understand the graphs I'm going to show you in a little bit. So we have first the clinical examination is when the neurologist comes and push on your arms, push on your fingers, push on your feet and see how strong you are and they grade that. Then they check your reflexes with the reflex hammer. And then they check your sensation with the pinprick, with the tuning fork to see if you feel the vibration, uh, the light touch, the temperature, etc. And then we come up with a score. Uh, it's called the NIS, or Neuropathy Impairment Score. And zero is normal, and it can go up to 300 plus. Nerve conduction study is when the physician stimulates your nerve with an electrical current, and they measure how strong and how quickly the impulse travel, and then the quantitative sensory testing, a more detailed exam of your sensation with the monofilament light chain, with the temperature, heat, as pain, etc. And then autonomic nervous system testing is how your heart rate is changing with breathing and how your blood pressure is responding when they tilt you up from a uh, laying down position. And you add all these numbers and you come with a score called the MNIST plus 7 and it ranges from zero being normal to over 300 and something being completely abnormal. You also look at the Norfolk quality of life um, and that again, zero is normal and as it go goes higher, it becomes uh, abnormal. And then the FAP staging as usually as a secondary outcome. So in 2018, I think that was a breakthrough in HATTR. We had two major publications, extremely important, looking at patisiran and looking at inotercin and, the, and how they do in people with uh, peripheral neuropathy from HATTR. So they studied about 222 patients or 25 in the patisiran study and 172 um, in the uh, inotercin study. And what these drugs do, they interfere with the production of the TTR. So they tell the liver, stop making TTR. So you have a drop in the uh, concentration or the circulating TTR in the blood, a really dramatic drop uh, by about 80%. Um, and very quickly, as you can see here, in both the patisseran and inonotocin, you had a drop in the TTR protein that is circulating uh, very quickly. And what that translated into, it translated into less amyloid circulating in the blood than depositing in organs, and improvement or stabilization of the neuropathy in people who did get the drug. And in the placebo group, uh, if you look on these two pictures here, you have a worsening. So again, going up is bad um, and on the MNIST score and on the Norfolk, and being stable or going down is, is very good. And this is what we've seen. So very effective drugs. They work uh, relatively quickly, in my opinion, and the uh, uh, benefit on the quality of life is also significant. Uh, these drugs had a little bit of issues with the patisseran. We had to pre-medicate people. People will get uh, infusion-associated reactions. We get steroids and antihistamine, et cetera. And then with the inotercin, you had the, the platelet issue. So you had to monitor the platelet uh, you know, every week. You may have kidney issue, et cetera. But overall, they're pretty safe, and, and uh, uh, they're really a success, in my opinion. Now, this works on about a year and a half, but it's important to know what happens in the future. Do these drugs continue to work? And we do have, every now and then, uh, follow-up studies from, uh, from the, the, the data that we have. So looking at almost three years here, you see the suppression of the TTR continues, which is important, right? You don't want the body to stop responding to treatment and the TTR to start creeping back up. This is at least uh, you know, three years plus and you still have suppression of the TTR protein uh, tremendously. And uh, looking at the clinical data looks 
very good too. So you still have kind of stabilization of the disease uh, really over three years, which is very Im important and really not seen before in people with HATTR. Now, I want to point out something extremely important is if you look at the placebo group, which is the upper one, and the line that, that happens at 18 months, that's when everybody goes on the open label, so everybody who was on placebo switch to the treatment. Unfortunately, um, these patients don't join the group that started on the treatment uh, before. And this is important because that means if you have axonal loss and if you have disability and you don't treat it right away, you may lose something that is irreversible. So the good news is that they're stable, they're not getting worse, but they're not joining the, the group that started the treatment early. So this is why a lot of time we're obsessed and you see us repeating Dr. Brannigan and I, the nerve conduction study, the exam, uh, you know, if you don't have symptoms yet, we repeat them very carefully, maybe every six months, every year, every two years, to make sure you don't develop neuropathy so we can start the treatment as soon as possible. Because we know the sooner you start the treatment, the better the outcome. So we don't want to wait uh, several years. The other thing to look at this data, and you have to remember, this is really an average. So this is the average of the patient. So what happened to individual patients really varies actually a lot, and it get kind of diluted in the, in the statistics, et cetera. So if you look more carefully at people who improved, you have about seven to 10% maybe who improve with treatment, meaning they gain function, they, they lost function, they were using, for example, a walker, and now they don't use a walker. No change. And that's the majority of patient, and this is a good thing. So a lot of patients expect to get better, and I tell them, you know, we, we want to maintain what you have. We don't want to lose further. So if you get better, that's great, but really the objective is to maintain what you have. And, you know, unfortunately, there's a small proportion of patients, 10 to 20 percent, who continue to progress. So we do need better treatment, and we do need to treat people as early as possible. So it's important to keep this in mind when we're starting treatment, we want to keep people stable. That's really the, 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 mo the goal, or slow down the progression of the disease. So the people who worsened without treatment, they may have worsened much quicker, but they have worsened at a slower pace because they are getting treated. So this was a great success, but as I mentioned, there was side effects, there was issue with the treatment. So now we have version two of the drugs that are even much better than what we had before. We have Vitriceran, which is the improved form of the uh, uh, small interfering RNA drug, Batiseran, and Eplotercin, which is the improved version of the antisense oligonucleotide. Vitriceran or Amfutra, you give it subcutaneously once every three months. There's no premedication with it. That's great and very little side effects. And Eplotercin, you give it once a month, and you don't have to worry about the platelets or the kidney or et cetera. So looking at these drugs, they, again, they suppress the TTR production dramatically. This is the vitriceran in the light blue. Actually, a little bit better than petiseran if you, if, if you look at this graph, so maybe closer to 85%. And same thing with the eblotercin. You have a significant suppression, about 80%, compared to the placebo and compared to inotercin in the past. And these drugs, again, work. Looking at historical placebo and eblotercin, the MNIST plus 7 is stable. And the quality of life is actually improving, so this is really good news. And looking at the Vitriceran data, things again remain stable. So very good um, efficacy of these drugs. And overall, looking at the adverse event, uh, it's much better than the prior medication that we're using. So how am I doing on time? I feel like I'm taking You're too long. Fine. I'm fine, okay. You, you can, I can speed up <laughs> times two. If Dr. Gertz is not breathing on your neck, you okay. do it. He's very far. Um, so we talked about silencing the liver to tell it stop making this TTR protein, which is actually a very good strategy and it works. Let's talk a little bit about the stabilizers. So uh, there are two stabilizers that we can use in the United States. You have uh, Diflunizol and you have uh, Tefamidus. And both of those were studied also in peripheral neuropathy. And um, they were randomized one to one. People would get either placebo or uh, diflunizol. Same thing with stephamidis. And kind of similar picture. You look at the MNIST plus seven, it got much worse in the placebo group compared to the people who took tafamidis. And same thing with the uh, diflunizol. The patient who uh, took diflunizol every day had a slower progression of their neuropathy 
than the people who took placebo. So again, these drugs work on the neuropathy as well. And overall, they're pretty safe. They're very tol well tolerated and, and relatively safe. Now, we get to the point, we have drugs that are approved for the neuropathy, we have drugs that are approved for the cardiomyopathy, so what happens if people take both? Do we have people who are taking both here? Can you show me? Is that a third, uh, maybe a third, maybe less, okay. Okay, so people end up on both, and remember these are expensive drugs and they haven't really been studied to be on both, so is it safe to be on both first? The answer is probably yes. Um, and is it more effective to be on both? And the answer is I don't know. And we tried to look at that at, at Penn, at the University of Pennsylvania, where I work, and um, you know, about a third plus patient uh, were actually taking both medication. And when we look if there's a difference in the hospitalization or the death rate, um, there was a numerical difference favoring the combination, but if you look at the statistics, there actually wasn't. So at this time, it's really unclear if taking both medication is more beneficial. We know it's safe. We just don't know. We just need to follow these patients further. And again, because you have very expensive drugs, it's unclear if you really need to use them. Plus, remember, if you are on the tefamidus or diflunazole, it is not only helpful for the cardiac disease, it's also helpful for the neuropathy. So at the end of the day, this is one disease, and wherever you target the uh, whether it's silencing or stabilizing, I think people will, will benefit as long as you're on something. So thank you very much, and I'll pass now to uh, Dr. Brannigan or Dr. Gertz.